once mighty city, Great Zimbabwe. For hundreds of years, a mysterious civilization reigned supreme here on the Zimbabwe Plateau. Then suddenly in the 16th century, it crumbled, leaving behind only a riddle. Who had built these massive walls? Obsessed with legends of a lost white civilization, a German explorer stumbled upon the ruins. Was this the legendary city of Sheba, he thought? Whose queen captured the heart of King Solomon? Fifty years later, an archaeologist in her quest for the truth unearthed an even more remarkable past. Had Great Zimbabwe been the center of a powerful black culture, one of the greatest cities of its time? This idea sparked furious debate and threatened to overturn centuries of bias about Africans and their history. The German explorer Karl Mauch searches for a legendary city he's convinced lies hidden in wildest Africa. Mauch has spent six years in Africa, overcoming poverty, sickness, and numerous scrapes with death in pursuit of his obsession. Against all odds, Mauch discovers immense stone walls that cover hundreds of acres. He is overawed. What he has found are the ruins of an ancient civilization, the only one of its kind in sub-Saharan Africa. Mauch believes this discovery will be his crowning achievement. Mauch's obsession with Africa began as a child. At that time, Africa was a land of mystery. Fantastic stories hinted at wondrous landscapes populated by exotic animals and wild natives. At age 10, while gazing at a map of Africa, Mauch vowed to one day explore its uncharted lands. Like many Europeans, Mach's understanding of Africa was based on legends that grew out of the Bible. Then she gave the king a hundred and twenty talents of gold. Never again came such an abundance as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Solomon, the wisest and richest Hebrew king from the Bible, inspired many later legends. One told of Solomon's gold mines at a place in Africa called Ophir. Others spoke of the enigmatic Queen of Sheba. She was a beautiful seductress who appeared in Jerusalem, paid homage to King Solomon, became his lover, then just as suddenly disappeared back to her mysterious land which lay hidden somewhere in Africa. Arab traders plied the East African coast in search of the lands of Sheba and Ophir. The Africans who traded with these Arabs came to believe that Solomon's mines and Sheba's lost city were somewhere in the interior. 
Mauch burned to be the man who would discover these legendary lands. But Mauch was poor, his options limited. Living in very modest circumstances, I was bound by my parents to become a teacher. And I was unfortunately denied the opportunity for further studies at a university. I've endeavored to obtain knowledge of medicine by talking with doctors and reading medical journals. I have started the practice of collecting insects, herbs, and minerals. Karl Marx did not come from a privileged background whatsoever. Karl Marx was a self-made man. What he did was he taught himself cartography, geology, all the sciences that were needed for him to be a great explorer in Africa, like Livingston, Burton, Speak. That's what Karl Marx came from. That's what he wanted to be. The dream of African exploration consumed Mauch. By practicing gymnastics and walking six miles a day in every season over any ground, often without food or drink, I have tried to steal my body. Mauch wrote to the German Geographical Institute in hope of gaining their support for an expedition to unexplored Africa. The response was harshly negative. It warned that African exploration should be left to the professionals. It went without saying that this meant people of higher social standing. He carried this letter with him for years. Karl Marx was not accepted by the German Geographical Institute because really he wasn't a member of the club. He was self-taught, he'd never been to university, he had no titles, he had no connections. He had no hope, really. The German Geographic Institute had good reason to reject Mauch. African exploration was a dangerous and expensive affair. By the time Mauch dreamed of Africa, hundreds of European adventurers and missionaries had already died there. Most explorers were independently wealthy or well-connected. In Africa, they could afford to hire scores of natives, who became their laborers, porters, guides, and translators. Mauch, however, had nothing, not even ship fare to Africa. Determined to explore wildest Africa, Mauch, age 27, enlisted as a crew member on a ship sailing for Durban, South Africa, in 1864. At last, the ship reached Africa. How I wished for the time when, for the first occasion, I would be able to set foot on this strange soil. But the reality of Durban and the many other European settlements in South Africa clashed with Mauch's dream of an untamed land. South Africa in 1865 was inhabited by, of course, a great number of tribes, the Khorza, the Zulu, the Sutu, and by this time, quite a few whites, about a quarter million whites had come, settled, immigrated, whatever you like, and in fact conquered a bit. Mauch wanted to be at the frontier, at the edge of the excitement, the adventure. But even in a small forest near civilized German, he felt lost in an alien world. It struck him all at once that Africa might pose a greater challenge than he could handle. I got into denser bush, the high trees with their somber crowns growing close to one another. Even the smallest sound could be heard. In all honesty, a feeling of fear got hold of me. I felt so terribly deserted amid the surrounding strange nature. He overcame this panic and struck out on foot for the frontier in what is now northern South Africa. Mm -hmm. 
Mauk walked for three weeks doing odd jobs at farms in exchange for food and shelter. He joined one of the wagon trains that carried supplies to frontier settlements. In his spare time, he took notes, sketched and collected specimens. He fell in love with the country, but not the settlers, most especially the Boer, the Dutch colonists. He thought they were uncivilized, and their treatment of blacks a disgrace. A kaffir, or native colored, is in the opinion of the Boer, not a man. Mauk's trip to the frontier took months, but it carried him to the threshold of his goal, uncharted Africa. Scattered African villages and European farming towns dotted the vast tracts of open land along the frontier. Now I could tell myself, passed the preparatory class and entered the high school of traveling. You have become the top of the form. Over the next year, Mauk tentatively ventured from the frontier towns and villages to explore what lay beyond. Many of the Africans he encountered were unfriendly. White settlers were pushing from the south, and the Africans resisted further intrusions. They were especially suspicious of anyone making maps or surveying the land. To disguise his intentions, Mauk developed a novel plan. He feigned a sort of madness. It succeeded. The Africans pronounced him insane, and left him free to do as he pleased. <laughs> With just a simple compass and a pen and ink set, Mao created the first maps and sketches of the South African interior. He sent his journals to the Geographical Institute in Germany, the same group that had rejected him. They began to publish Mauck's accounts and to his great satisfaction, portrayed him as a model German explorer. German sponsors even began to send small sums to support his efforts. Mauck's status grew even further when he made the first gold discovery in southern Africa. Word quickly spread. Prospectors filtered into the area, but Mauck never staked a claim to the field. I have before me a choice between my gold discoveries and my explorations. Without hesitation, he chose exploration, and so gave up the chance to make a fortune. Adventure and respect were what Mauch had desperately sought and was finally achieving. wanted more. In 1868, at the age of 31, Karl Mauck set off on an expedition into unexplored Africa.
I may, without exaggeration, call this journey a long fight against hunger. Game was scarce. Bands of hostile warriors stalked Mao. He lived in constant fear. While mapping the swampy coastline, Mauk contracted malaria. Went without food for eight days and fell into a coma. Fevers and ill health would torment him for the rest of his life. Mauk revived when local Africans told him of an abandoned stone city past the Limpopo River. Though still weak, Mauk resolved to find the fabled city, and in January of 1871, six years after arriving in Africa, he set forth on the adventure he believed was his destiny. When Mauk crossed the Limpopo River, he entered a land unknown to Europeans. It was also an alien world in which Mauk offered an easy target for chiefs who demanded gifts. His trade goods quickly dwindled. In these circumstances, one has to exert patience. One has to assume the right expression on one's face when handing out presents. As Mauk pushed into the interior, villagers who did not own firearms demanded he hunt for them. At one point, he was feeding 40 people a day who did no work in return. While other explorers bullied and slashed their way across Africa, Mauk tried negotiation and generosity with his porters. A cold wind blew during the night between the mountains. I took pity on the naked, skinny figures shivering in the cold and gave them my own woolen blankets. His efforts to win their goodwill failed. Eight months into the trip, they disappeared. They'd sliced open his bags and stolen much of his goods. He felt trapped. I could not flee, as the second night followed the first night position was desperate, and it was therefore not surprising when the thought occurred to me to take my own life before I succumbed to slow torture. But Mauk must have known that his goal was near. The next day, he snapped out of his despair and headed to a local village. There, he hired guides who led him to a distant mountaintop. Mauch beheld ancient walls in the valley below. God be praised. That is what I have been seeking. Only a few days before, I was occupied with grave thoughts of death, and today, I stand before the most brilliant success of my travels.
After six hard years of exploration, Karl Mauck discovered Great Zimbabwe. He was amazed by what he saw. Stone walls spread over a square mile of the valley floor, bounded on one end by ruins on a hill. At the center of it all stood an enormous enclosure, 30 feet high and hundreds of feet around. Mauk realized he stood within the remains of a sprawling city. It had been a culture unique in sub-Saharan Africa. Thousands lived in the city, and remarkably, they built in stone. Mauk dismissed the possibility of local Africans having created it. Mauk was not immune to European prejudices about Africa, and they guided his thinking. In Mauk's mind, Africans built grass huts and lived off the land. It was inconceivable to him that they could construct such a magnificent city. The local Africans seemed to share Mauk's views. All are absolutely convinced that white people once inhabited the region. Overlooking clear signs of African occupation and ignorant of archaeology, Mauk turned to the Bible and legend for his answer. The whole fantastic site, Mauk believed, was the queen of Sheba's palaces and temples. The center of the legendary golden realm of Ophir. Mauch searched for evidence to support his theory. He cut splinters from a wooden beam. The smell which it exudes is of great similarity to that of cedar wood, used in pencils. The color, too, is the same. Mauch believed Sheba had imported the cedar from Lebanon, a land to the north of ancient Israel. local African tribes provided further evidence for Mao. He thought their customs of circumcision and ritual butchering had been learned from Sheba generations before and passed down through the years. Mao was ecstatic. He believed he'd just made one of the greatest discoveries of all time, a legendary lost city rescued from oblivion in Africa. Mauk's frenzy of excitement crashed when he again fell sick. Desperate and alone, he knew that to stay alive, he'd have to return home. After seven years of adventure and hardship, Mauk dragged himself to the coast and left Africa forever. Germany had changed radically during Mauk's time in Africa. War and politics preoccupied his countrymen. And Mauk's earlier exploits had largely been forgotten. But the greatest blow fell when the people Mauk most admired, scientists and historians, dismissed his theories about Sheba. A chemist determined that the wood Mauk had cut from the Zimbabwe ruins was indigenous to Africa. It wasn't cedar brought there from Lebanon. Others pointed out that Mauk's sketches of Great Zimbabwe's walls looked nothing like the buildings of ancient Jerusalem. 
and they ridiculed the idea of black Africans practicing Jewish rituals. In his furious attempts to make sense of Great Zimbabwe, Mauk became more disoriented than he'd ever been in the wilds of Africa. Racked by fevers, he grew increasingly irrational and unpredictable. In early 1875, Mauk fell to his death from the window of his garret. The circumstances surrounding his death are still unclear. Karl Mauk died at the age of 38. Despite all that Mauk accomplished and all that he overcame to reach Great Zimbabwe, the only memorial to him stands in Germany at a teacher's training college. His theories about a lost white settlement did, however, find an eager audience, especially in the British colonies of Rhodesia and South Africa. Um, the imperial mission in Africa was really one of racial superiority. Now, to have it thought that Africans had constructed such enormous buildings as these on such a vast scale was really unthinkable. No one could have imagined it. No one could have believed it. Therefore, for imperialism, it was very important that these buildings were thought to be built by outsiders, people other than Africans. Almost anyone would do. South African and Rhodesian settlers would fight to the last for their vision of a white Great Zimbabwe. They countered any challenge to the myth of white superiority with a storm of vitriol and ridicule. Only a formidable character could withstand this onslaught. Fifty years later, in 1929, one of the world's foremost archaeologists, Gertrude Caton Thompson, scoured the ruins of Great Zimbabwe for clues to its origins. Years of hard work and struggle had won Gertrude grudging respect in a male-dominated field, but Great Zimbabwe posed her greatest challenge yet. All evidence of the identity of the city's builders appeared to have been erased. But failure was not an option for Gertrude. Tireless in her pursuit of the truth, Gertrude would search until she found what she needed, the key to unlock the mystery of Great Zimbabwe's origins. Few would have predicted such a life for Gertrude. She was born in 1888 into a privileged English family but it was also unstable. Her father died when she was young, her mother was sickly. From an early age, Gertrude learned to rely only on herself. Travel was one of the few constants in her life. Something of value had been gained from the travels of my early childhood. Pompeii and Rome stand out in memory because I felt the first stirrings of interest in past civilizations. But it would take time for these stirrings to become passion. In her 20s, Gertrude's existence was an aimless one. Life at home was pleasant for a well-to-do family during that pampered pre-war period. Visits to relatives and friends were leisurely things. Constant amusement at games, parties, dances, and theaters followed each other endlessly. She became attracted to a young soldier, Carlyon McFarlane. In 1914, just after the outbreak of the First World War, Carlion received a short leave from the fighting in France. He visited Gertrude.
time flew, and apart from the war, we talked nostalgically of the carefree past. I faced the fact that I loved him with my whole being. For the next two years, as Carleon fought in the trenches, Gertrude threw herself into the war effort. In 1916, news arrived that turned Gertrude's life upside down. On September 16th, Carleon was killed in an ambush. Gertrude never recovered from his death. Almost 25 years later, she visited McFarlane's mother. When I left to say goodbye, she was in bed. After a parting embrace, I noticed for the first time Carleon's sword and medals. She said, in a tone of assertion, not of query, you loved him. I replied, he was loved by everyone who knew him. For Gertrude, the option of marriage and a family of her own died with Carleon McFarlane. And it wasn't a subject that she talked about much or hardly at all, but it must have had a huge influence on her, on her career. I mean, if she'd uh, become, been married and probably been a, so, uh, a soldier's and an ambitious soldier's wife, uh, she might never have gone in for the things she did. Gertrude withdrew from almost all personal relationships. In later years, one of the few deep friendships she formed was with the De Navarro family. Gertrude helped raise their son, Michael. His memories are of a woman whose strong character intimidated others, but to him, she was warm and devoted. She was a formidable person, somebody of a type that you don't have now, I think, very much somebody of her age. Um, passionate in support of the things she believed in, um, obstinate, um, no lover of fools, uh, and certainly no patience with them, and yet uh, very loving and affectionate to those who were close to her, which I was lucky enough to be. In 1920, Gertrude sought to escape the easy trappings of her earlier life. She volunteered at an archaeological dig in the south of France. During the visit, I made a new interest, prehistory. With the determination that marked the rest of her life, Gertrude, now 32, pursued her new passion, archaeology. Archaeology was still a new and rapidly expanding field. Demand for specialists created opportunities for professionals. The discipline and precision of modern archaeology suited Gertrude's exacting and perfectionist nature. Her dedication brought her to the attention of one of the world's top Egyptologists, Sir Flinders Petrie. he asked her to assist him on a dig in Egypt. Sir Flinders Petrie was a demanding and often difficult teacher, but Gertrude excelled. In 1924, Sir Flinders Petrie helped her obtain a small grant for her own dig in Egypt. It was a great success. Her conclusions pushed back the date for the origin of Egyptian civilization 5,000 years. Although they have since proved correct, they contradicted Sir Petrie's own theories. He severed all support. Gertrude raised the funds herself and continued. She would never relent to threats or bullying. An Anglo-Rhodesian foundation approached Gertrude about conducting a dig at Great Zimbabwe. 
They hope to uncover clues about the mysterious civilization that once flourished there. Gertrude Caton Thompson was a formidable woman. She had worked under the most impossible conditions and under the most impossible archaeologists in Egypt, uh, and in the end running large-scale excavations of her own. Uh, she was carefully chosen to undertake the work at Great Zimbabwe. She was ideally suited to it. The foundation set one condition, that Gertrude present her conclusions about Great Zimbabwe's origins to the British Association for the Advancement of Science in only eight months' time. This was a tight deadline under the best of circumstances. Undaunted, Gertrude accepted. Gertrude arrived in Beira, a port in Portuguese Mozambique, just ahead of a raging cyclone. The noise of the collapsing town, the many ships in harbor dragging their chains and crashing into each other, hooting wildly, was dramatic. Massively, I am not easily alarmed. She rode out the storm with typical calm, but found that the cyclone had destroyed the rail lines. Gertrude drove towards Rhodesia, but the rainy season turned the roads to mud and the rivers to churning torrents. After weeks of delay, she finally reached Salisbury, the capital of Rhodesia. Rhodesia was named for the great industrialist and imperialist Cecil Rhodes. Rhodes masterminded British expansion throughout Southern Africa, personally controlling thousands of square miles of land as he created one of the world's greatest fortunes. In the capital of Salisbury, Gertrude paused to gather supplies. In just 40 years, white settlers had created a bustling farm community in Salisbury, but had been built at the expense of black Africans. Whites lived well, overseeing farms and mines, while blacks were relegated to menial jobs with subsistence wages, poor housing, and no education. The white mindset of racial superiority was pervasive, poisoning every aspect of life. When one prominent white woman asked if her sons might help with the upcoming excavation, Gertrude said they could if they would dig alongside the native workmen. Just as Gertrude expected, the request was promptly withdrawn. At dinner one night, the governor promoted the idea that Great Zimbabwe's ruins were of ancient and thereby white origin. Gertrude countered that her job required objectivity. I replied that I had no idea one way or the other and only hoped I might get an answer. The team Gertrude brought to Great Zimbabwe reflected her willingness to flaunt convention. It was an all-woman team. I think very deliberately, she always worked with women and was one of the first uh, feminists in archaeology. It was one of the first all-female archaeological teams in history. Gertrude and the others examined miles of ruins in their first days there. Normally, a site this size offers numerous options for an archaeologist. But many others had been there before Gertrude. She was stunned by what they had done. Generations of treasure hunters and previous archaeologists had laid bare practically all that remained. 
In brief, fulfillment of my task seemed dubious. For Gertrude Caton Thompson, the site at Great Zimbabwe had changed enormously since Mark's time. What had happened, in fact, was that a whole bunch of people had decided they could, would find gold here at Great Zimbabwe, and they had literally pillaged, plundered, pulled the walls, walls down, done everything. Prospectors formed the Rhodesian Ancient Ruins Company to extract gold. They dug numerous trenches and undermined walls, but found little gold. What they did loot was of great archaeological value. They melted it down and sold it as bullion. Priceless artifacts were lost forever. Early treasure seekers also uncovered stone birds. Cecil Rhodes bought two to mark the entrance to his estate and hired men to search Great Zimbabwe for evidence that it had been built by a white civilization. In their rush to prove that Zimbabwe was of white origin, excavators moved tons of topsoil, destroying artifacts of African origin. The damage was irreparable. As for evidence of white occupation or construction, nothing was ever unearthed. The devastated condition of the ruins left Gertrude at an apparent dead end. She and her team dug at several sites, and she paid the laborers bonuses for their hard work. Still, she found nothing conclusive. Time was running out. The British Association meeting loomed. Gertrude arranged for a plane so that she could inspect the ruins from a new perspective. She became one of the first archaeologists to use aerial observation. As she swept past the hill ruins, Gertrude spotted a path that from the ground was obscured by vegetation. It led to terraces beneath the hill walls and had clearly not been used in hundreds of years. Treasure seekers had overlooked the seemingly inaccessible terraces. The next day, Gertrude moved her team onto the hill terraces. There, they uncovered a wealth of objects untouched by anyone but the original inhabitants. Everything that Gertrude Caton Thompson found was clearly African. There were changes in uh, the pottery, in the pottery designs, but all was African. The only foreign material she found were glass beads, and Far Eastern ceramics, uh, Near Eastern ceramics, but these were firmly dated to about the 13th century. So they, in fact, reinforced the African material, that this was a 13th century uh, local culture that had trade connections overseas. Gertrude determined that Great Zimbabwe had been a black African city from the 9th to the 14th centuries, a major hub in a huge sophisticated trade system. Great Zimbabwe had straddled the trade route Africans followed as they carried ivory and gold from the interior to the coast. Their trade partners were Arab merchants, who were the great middlemen, dealing in goods from as far away as India and China. Gertrude compiled her findings just in time for the British Association meeting.
She expected a hostile reaction to the idea of a black Great Zimbabwe, but headed into the controversy with her usual poise. Gertrude presented her findings to an overflow crowd in Johannesburg on August 2nd, 1929. Her presentation was meticulous, her conclusions crystal clear. Instead of a degenerate offshoot of another civilization, you have here a native civilization showing national organization of a high kind, originality, and amazing industry. She portrayed a living, vibrant, black African city in which the walls formed a series of interlocking courtyards where women cooked, children played, men worked. In one extraordinary paper, Gertrude killed the myth of a lost white civilization. In its place, she described a thriving black metropolis. It was estimated to house 10 to 15,000 people, a city as large as many in Europe at the time. Many were scandalized. They remained convinced that Africans were simply incapable of creating such a civilization. Several stormed from the room. Even the normally calm Gertrude was shaken by the fury her conclusions triggered. Gertrude Caton Thompson's work made, gave her the highest reputation among academics and scientists. It uh, did nothing to persuade the settler uh, to overcome his prejudices. And nothing that anyone could do, either Caton Thompson or in the 50 years subsequent to her, were going to convince people with such strong racial prejudices that Great Zimbabwe was not exotic. She bade farewell to her African work. Her sense of irony surfaced when she recalled how the foreman asked to come with her. I explained that he would not be happy in our cold country with no one to talk to in his Bantu language. Are there no black men in England, he asked. I replied, no, we are all white. After a puzzled reflection, he said, no blacks? Then who does the work? Gertrude left for England in late 1929, but the controversy surrounding Great Zimbabwe followed her. In 1930, Gertrude's finds from Great Zimbabwe were exhibited at the British Museum in London. I undertook to be present three days a week to answer questions and be long-suffering to the many who continued to believe in the Queen of Sheba. In the exhibit's wake came letters in the press and lively correspondence from strangers. I refrained from being drawn into these. But she kept a special file. Kane Thompson was a very professional scientist. She could be quite cold and quite clinical in the things she did. She put the quality of her work above all else, and she could not tolerate fools. And to her, many of those who speculated on Great Zimbabwe were nothing but fools. Gertrude's combative nature worked against her in 1938 on her last major dig. She traveled to South Arabia with another all-female team but she fought constantly with an associate over everything, from the food to the expedition's purpose. Gertrude hoped to find connections between South Arabia and Great Zimbabwe. Perhaps the Arab traders who had brought goods to the African coast from India and China had influenced Great Zimbabwe's builders. Gertrude looked for common architecture, art, stonemasonry, anything that might link the two places. She encountered Arabs who still practiced traditional stone building techniques, but their ties to Great Zimbabwe were unclear.
Towards the end of the expedition, she became gravely ill. Sick and exhausted, she returned to England. She began to suffer from spells of lightheadedness that plagued her for the rest of her life. A doctor diagnosed a distended heart. Now 50 years old, Gertrude settled into a quiet life with her friends, the De Navarros, and their young son, Michael. They became the stable family she'd never had. But in the end, uh, she moved in with us, and that was a very happy arrangement. It was like having an extra and honorary aunt living with as part of the family. Gertrude's greatest legacy was to reveal that high civilization arose in sub-Saharan Africa. White settlers could no longer claim Great Zimbabwe as their own. When the black majority in Rhodesia gained control in 1979, they renamed their country Zimbabwe to identify themselves with Africa's glorious past. The ruins, which once illustrated the folly of prejudice and bias, now stand for an independent, dynamic Africa. As Gertrude Caton Thompson said, Great Zimbabwe lies in the still pulsating heart of Africa.